good morning ladies and gentlemen and good to see you all again. I'm in this fantastic bluebell wood in my part of the world in South East England and the aroma and the scent coming off these bluebells is absolutely amazing and there's birds nesting everywhere so I thought I'm going to move my office outside today and why not. Um, this video is as the title implied sort of about birds in flight and wildlife photography camera settings. Um, I'm going to talk about my thinking um, and the thinking behind my settings. I'm not going to make it overly technical, so I hope that um, is okay with people. And I'm going to start, split it into two parts. First part on focusing, and secondly on exposure. Um, I'm then going to suggest some options, including a great go-to setting um, that will work a lot of the time for most photographers, and it's a great place to start to minimize those missed shots. And then I'm going to slow some slightly more advanced um, options that hopefully you'll find useful and you can use when the situation develops and you become maybe more experienced as a photographer and obviously those are aimed at guys who are maybe struggling a little bit but are experienced uh, wildlife photographers already and um, I'm aiming I think this is more at newcomers to wildlife um, but the settings also apply for sports photography uh, and other action um, photography situations and I think they apply for both. Um, I just hope there's something for everybody and I hope you enjoy it. Um, before we start, um, I think there are three things that um, I should say, for me at least, are no-brainers with regards what every wildlife photographer should be using um, virtually all of the time, expecting, except in very special situations. Um, continuous AF focus, which is obviously continuous autofocus. Whatever the setting on your camera is, um, in Nikon it's AFC, it's AI Servo in Canon, um, Sony as well I think is AFC. Um, so continuous servo focus, you need to have that set. Equally have your, number two, have your highest frame rates per second. Uh, there's no point having a camera that can shoot at eight frames a second if you don't use it, particularly with wildlife. It really, really helps. Digital images, images are free, so you know why not make the most of it? Um, and thirdly for me is back button focusing. It's, there are people who don't like it. I find it's an absolute godsend. It's where you separate. As opposed to out of the box, your camera has its focus on the shutter release button, so you will focus and press the release to take your picture. All you do is you separate the function within the camera. Um, the shutter release button becomes just that, the shutter release button, and you transfer the focus mode onto a button on your back, your AF on button invariably. I find it's incredibly good um, for focusing and recomposing. I didn't start off with it for the first six or nine months and then when I moved to it, it takes a little bit of getting used to, but I promise very, very few people go to it and then come back. But if you don't like it and you prefer another method, that's absolutely fine. But for me personally, I find back button focusing for focusing and recomposing. And equally, it means I can keep any subject in focus all the way through, uh, through a particular image. I can keep it in focus and then as it appears, in the frame that I want to shoot, maybe in a particular area of a field where there's less distraction and it's creatively a better image, I can simply focus and when I get to the point I can take a picture and so on. And the, the, the subject is in focus all the time. So back button focusing, AFC continuous focus and your maximum frames a second are the three no-brainers that you want to have. Right, as I mentioned I'm going to split uh, this into two subjects. Um, focusing is number one, exposure is number two. Um, focusing is quite, we're going to get whizzed through it, but it's actually relatively straightforward. Um, I think there's two key thoughts you can have um, to, con and to consider when you're looking at your focusing. And one is you want your camera to be as quick as possible in grabbing focus. It's really, really important it grabs focus as quickly as possible. So the more work you give it to do, the less efficient it's going to be and the slower it will be to focus. Um, this problem is exasperated by things like um, low light, generally tricky lighting conditions or a subject that's being really quite erratic. So I say that's point one, we're going to try and give your camera as little to do as possible so it grabs focus efficiently. Number two with focusing um, is very much your physical approach to focusing. It is a technique about how you hold the camera, how you pan the camera, um, and it's very much like anything else. The more you practice, the better you'll get. And if you get better at physically focusing, then your camera will gra grab focus quicker. Your subject will be in the frame more often. Therefore, you'll get more shots. So think about the way you stand. You should be balanced. You should swing your whole body, not your hands and arms. Um, the way you breathe out when you take the picture. 
um, a bit like being you know firing a rifle it really really helps keep your elbows in and one other thing I do quite often is I keep both eyes open because if you are panning or even whether you're in a hide and the camera's on tripod if you can get to do both eyes you can see with your peripheral vision if another bird comes into frame or I had a situation in the barn owls where crows were mobbing them I don't think I would have noticed that until it was too close in the frame and I could see them circling above and I got ready for the shot so again focusing is quite a practical skill, um, whereas you could argue that um, exposure, which we're going to come on to, um, has an aesthetic quality as well, where you, the things you do affect the real look of the image, whereas focusing is a bit more practical. That nicely brings us on to focus points. Um, which is often a big topic of discussion amongst wildlife photographers and the key thing to remember is more points means more work for your camera. Um, your camera works on movement and contrast so the less you've got of those two the more it will struggle and my rule is very simple what I recommend is you start with one point of focus and see if that works. It will focus very quickly, very accurately. You can put it on the, on the animal or bird's head or face or eye, whatever you have the options to. Why would I change? The only reason I would change is if you're finding that the subject is too erratic, that you physically can't get enough times in focus. You're, you know, you're missing far too often, in which case go to, to, to maybe nine or five and experiment with it. But if you go right out to say 51 points of focus, there's two downsides. One is the camera gets slower. And the second one is, you never know quite when it lacks on the focus. If you've got something like a bar now flying, you won't quite know whether it's focused on the front wingtip or the tail or the head or the body. And it's very easy to get back into Lightroom and you've been using a wide aperture on your big 500mm or 300mm lens and you'll notice that none of them, although they look okay, uh, none of them the head is absolutely pin sharp. So with one point of focus, I think it's a really good system to you either nail it or you don't, but the ones you do get work really well. And I say, so think worse conditions, less points. Right. Um, if we've, we're happy, we could, if we've moved on from focusing, I hope everyone's okay with that. Um, topic number two, and probably the bane of more contention than anything, is exposure. Um, and I probably see more examples of under or overexposed images, um, which can be readily fixed. And um, for this purpose, I'm going to assume that we're using matrix or average metering, um, whatever you have in your camera, as opposed to spot or or center weighted metering which um which i do use very occasionally for certain subjects but realistically for 99 percent of wildlife photography matrix meeting works really well and as i say what we're trying to do is keep this simple so you don't miss any shots um, that's the idea anyway and i'm going to go through the uh the modes i recommend the methods i recommend in the order i think if you're new to wildlife photography i suggest you start this way i'm going to start with aperture priority um, with the option of exposure compensation um, and then I'm going to talk about manual and various options for manual methods uh, and finally I'm going to talk briefly about auto ISO which is a fantastic setting uh, which is really really useful and uh, I'll talk about that a little bit in depth as well um, but just for a few minutes I'm trying to keep this video as, as short as I can sensibly and I'm going to show some examples of why I use the different methods after each method and I'll talk through those as well which is why I've got the laptop. Can you believe it's actually spitting with rain? I can't believe it. Um, method number one is aperture priority with um, exposure compensation. Um, a lot of shots will occur really quickly and randomly. So how do you set up a nice quick response setting um, that works well for you? And I think for me, this is where aperture priority works really well as a go-to setting. Um, the basis is you control the aperture, you set a high enough ISO to ensure that your shutter speed um, is sufficient um, for whatever you're doing and the camera then sets the shutter speed. Um, so why aperture priority? Because obviously um, a lot of beginners will say to me, um, well surely shutter speed is, or shutter speed priority is more intuitive because you want to control the shutter speed because it's wildlife or a racing car and similar. Um, the key thing is your aperture has a big impact on the creative look of your photograph. 
and you want to be able to control that. If it goes to f2.0 or f8 and you've got no control over that, that will impact the look of your photograph. It will impact how much is in focus. And if you're using big lenses um, at wide apertures, your depth of field can get very small and you want to be able to control that. You don't want, say, the front of the, the barn owl's beak to be in focus, but the eye's out of focus. And sometimes situations are sufficient that you need to have that control. Okay, so just a couple of examples to show you. Um, here's a gorgeous red squirrel I photographed in Scotland a couple of years ago, and I was really, really keen to get these fantastic autumnal colors in the front of the image, totally diffused and out of focus. And only with aperture priority could I maintain that control and just concentrate on the squirrel's cute little head to keep him nice and sharp and get the background and foreground this lovely mushy uh, diffused style. Um, so aperture priority was a no-brainer here. If I'd been using shutter speed priority, it may have, I would have lost control of that aperture. And strange, I've used this image of this fantastic kingfisher emerging from the water with a fish because similar thing, the depth of field here was very small because I didn't know where he was going to dive. So I had to maintain that three or four inches of depth of field and I could only do that by using my aperture and hoping he dived into the water in the right area. If I'd been using a narrower, a, a wider aperture, um, I probably would have got very few shots in focus. So I hope those examples um, were useful. Um, so why not shutter priority? Um, remember, you only really use the shutter speed for two things. Um, stopping camera shake and effectively freezing the action or using blur to imply uh, movement creatively. There's no real difference between a thousandth of a second and a two thousandth of a second. Um, but can you imagine the difference between, as I say, f2.8 and f8, if the camera's controlling that, that makes a big difference. So even though it does seem a little bit illogical, and I understand that, um, keeping photographically, keeping control of your aperture is more important. Um, and if on the rare occasions you want to use your shutter speed to, to have that creative impact, um, it's very, very easy. It nearly always would be a situation that you've thought about um, and, uh, if you like, pre-composed. So all you need to do is um, adjust your ISO right down. Um, your aperture will be whatever you want it to be, but dropping your ISO right down until your shutter speed tumbles down to, say, a 60th or a 40th, and you can get that nice creative look. Uh, and I'm going to show you a, a couple of images as well here and talk them through um, using you know, your aperture priority but getting that creative effect with a slow shutter speed. Um, and bear in mind that slow shutter speeds, if you have really bad light, slow shutter speeds can be really good. So embrace the low light. If you are on a really, really bad day and it's dull, um, you know, be creative and use it. And you can do all that while in aperture priority. So a couple of images here taken in aperture priority, but um, using the shutter speed as I wanted to get a desired effect. These gannets in the Shetland Islands, this is taken in on, five, on a 500mm lens at a thirteenth of a second, simply by, um, on a, again, a dark day, reducing my ISO down to a level where I could get this effect. Very easy to do um, and staying in aperture priority. And same here with these mute swans, exactly the same effect. A fortieth of a second with a 500mm handheld. I wasn't worried about it being sharp. I just wanted this nice blurred effect. And uh, I could stay in aperture priority and very quickly then move on to another subject without worrying about coming out of manual and having to make lots of tweaks and changes. I can simply just come stay in aperture priority and push that ISO back up to the level I want. Now um, I'm just going to talk about the add on to use, I find, with um, aperture priority that works really well as that go to setting, and it's your exposure compensation button. Um, if you don't know where it is, you need to find it. And all that simply does is override your camera by one or two stops of under or over exposure. And it is the perfect option for those rare special situations you get. Um, so most of the time you can walk around with aperture priority, um, with the right ISO setting, you just walk around and you know you'll get a sensible shutter speed. You're using the aperture, pro um, aperture creatively and that'll all be good. But what happens when you have a special situation? And what is a special situation? A special situation is because you're using matrix metering or average metering, if you get a very bright subject with a dark background or vice versa, say a blackbird against snow, the camera will take that average reading and that's your special situation. 
And what you need to do is simply recognize that here is a special situation. You go to your exposure compensation. So you've got a barn owl with a white chest and it's sitting in the sunshine and the light is bouncing off its chest. And of course the, um, the barn owl is the subject, not the background or the surroundings or whatever. So you mustn't overexpose for the chest. So you say, this is a special situation. You let the camera do its work and you simply dial in by pressing the exposure compensation button and using the back dial, maybe one stop of underexposure. And all that does is override the camera and will allow for that variation of the special situation, the subject. So it could be a, a white seagull on a, a dark sandy beach or against a blue sky or a buzzard flying over a, 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 a cloudy sky. So you've got a dark bird with a, a black background. It's amazing how many people will take a picture of, say, a bird of prey coming over. And of course, the bird is completely in, in silhouette and they haven't really thought about it. So the skill, of course, is realizing that what is a special situation, which just takes practice, but it comes very quickly. And if you look at it and say, my camera's taking an average view, do I need to dial that in? And what you will find is the great thing is you can let the camera get everything. You simply point and focus and you look and you say, special situation, click, click, up or down for the very rare occasions you need it. And that will nail your exposure. Oh, there's a lovely egret I came across in uh, Minsmere in Suffolk. And it's actually a double whammy and a big vote of confidence for aperture priority of this picture, which is why I've used it. Because you can see as the sun rays um, hit the white feathers, obviously I realized it was going to get blown out. So I very quickly dialed in uh, about one and a half stops of underexposure while focusing and taking pictures. And then I also realized this fantastic branch. I wanted to get more of it in focus. So when I was initially at f4, it wasn't, but I, I very quickly on the aperture ring just changed it down to about uh, f8 and got the whole branch in focus, um, as well as allowing obviously for the overexposure of the feathers. So really a really good vote for aperture priority with exposure compensation. And here is a much more classic example from my video a few weeks ago about the barn owls, where it's a classic case of a bird with white feathers landing this time at sunrise in perfect gorgeous light and as the sun hit his feathers I immediately realized I mustn't let those overexpose so I simply dialed in one and a half to two stops of underexposure and just kept firing didn't even need to take the camera away from my eye so it's it's a really good in-field method and default setting to go for um, especially when you're starting photography. The other question that people ask of course is well how much um, exposure compensation do you dial in and the only answer is it's trial and trial and error and just practice and the more you do it the easier it gets what I would say from my point of view I very rarely use less than about 0.7 if, if there's a situation comes up that I regard as a special situation um, and it very rarely goes beyond about two points of under or over exposure so if you're in doubt you're out in the field something happens and a barn owl lands on a post the great thing to do is maybe get a couple of shots and then immediately dial in if the sun's hitting the white feathers um, dial in you know minus one to minus two shops under exposure um, that way you can guarantee the birds and the feathers will be fine and it will throw the background into into darkness which often is nice anyway and i'm going to show you a couple of examples of where i'm walking around images i took and whether i did use or didn't use any exposure compensation and why i did it so hopefully an image like this bitten where you can see there are very little highlights or dark areas you can see why you wouldn't need to dial in any exposure compensation just take the picture of this amazing bitten in this uh, aggressive display mode but when you come to something like puffins here they've got such a bright white chest you can you can realize before you even start shooting you're going to dial something in and i dialed in one to one and a half stops of underexposure to make sure the white chest didn't get blown out Number two is when we go into manual. And it, I think it scares a lot of people, especially when they're beginning. And there's two reasons. I think, um, firstly, uh, you need to have an understanding of what an aperture and a shutter speed do to your image. And similarly ISO. If you're going to use a camera manually, um, if you set the camera to f8 and a hundredth of a second, you need to know what impact will ha that will have on your setting. If you're unsure about those, that's why I recommend as a start, starting point, um, work with aperture priority, work with it, get used to it, 
understand what you can do creative with your aperture before you come onto manual. Um, it's fairly self-explanatory as I say because obviously you're controlling the aperture uh, and the shutter speed and it works best in a in a constant stable scenario where you have a time to measure the exposure of the subject um, and b actually if you can work out yes this is best for whatever it is I'm photographing for that same subject. So it's when you're in a nice controlled situation and I'll give you some examples. Um, and as I say, only really go on to this when you have that good understanding of aperture and shutter speed and the impacts they have on your image. Um, so I think it's one for beginners to work towards rather than start with. Um, otherwise it can be a bit of a recipe for disaster. And you will hear on YouTube a lot of people saying, no, you must use manual with various criteria. But I think for beginners, um, that's a bit too much to ask. And what you want to do is get confidence um, with sharp images that are roughly properly exposed and then you can work off that and that's why I say again um, start off with aperture priority and then we'll move on to manual. Animals in snow are the classic examples where the camera can get fooled and they're a perfect candidate for manual exposure. This wonderful mountain hare in Scotland popped out of this snow hole literally as I first arrived up in the mountains. And this is the raw file I took with my Nikon. And of course what happened is it underexposed the hare because of all the brightness of the snow. So it's a great example of, I very quickly went to manual, took a quick test shot of the hare. And I knew that so long as he didn't move around much, I had a nice stable situation where I could just set my exposure for whatever the hair was. So I then um, adjusted, read a, meter, read a meter reading off him. He was, for example, maybe a thousandth of a second at f8. And then, as you can see here, the new image uh, is basically when I've corrected and I've slightly cropped it and edited it slightly. But you can see now the hair is correct and the snow is blown out, which is actually what you want it to be, because that's what it actually looks like. So animals in snow, as they are a perfect candidate for, for manual exposure. And finally, that brings us on to our third option, which is um, auto ISO, um, which is a fantastic add-on to most cameras. Um, check it's available on your camera. Um, it can be used with most modes. Nikon, for instance, you can use it in any mode, manual, aperture priority, or shutter, shutter priority, or even programmed, etc. And I use it an awful lot with my aperture priority when I'm shooting in changing light, particularly at sunrise and sunset, where the light is dramatically changing up or down. And if you didn't use auto ISO, you'd constantly be checking and checking your exposure to make sure, do I change my aperture? Do, you know, what do I need to do? And auto ISO gives you some safety parameters and think of auto ISO, I think a great analogy is, think of it as a big safety net um, that basically protects you from going outside your comfort zone. And, and basically what you do, you set a parameter, I'll show you um, on the back of your camera. but you'll find it in your setup menu and you will for instance put in a maximum ISO of 4000 and you will also put in a minimum shutter speed of for example the 500th and your minimum shutter speed will be based on what you're comfortable with that you can shoot without getting say camera shake etc um, etc et so for argument's sake let's say 500 your camera in aperture priority will balance out the exposure perfectly normally until you hit a point for example when the light is dropping at sunset when you hit a 500th of a shutter speed. So using f4, you were shooting at a thousandth automatically, but as the light drops, so that shutter speed is automatically being brought down by the camera. Now you don't want to go below a 500th, but because you've set that as your low shutter speed parameter in auto ISO, the moment the camera hits that, it will then, as the light continues to drop, it will just increase the ISO right up as high as the maximum you set without going below a 500 so you don't get camera shake. It's a really brilliant add-on and as I say a few years ago people didn't, weren't that keen on it I think because it took your ISO up to levels that got very noisy. But cameras nowadays are so good with, um, with um, low noise at high ISO settings that it's not a problem. And at the end of the day you want a shop to be sharp and noisy, not 
unnoisy and fuzzy. So um, you always take a, a sharp shot over an unsharp shot every time. Try saying that after you've had five pints of Guinness. Um, it also same works with manual. Um, I find it works brilliantly with aperture priority as that little safety net as I mentioned. But if you do uh, evolve on and go into manual mode, um, in manual you can set both your aperture and your shutter speed. And I really love this setting and I use it quite a lot. Um, I would say it's not one for beginners, um, but what I can do, I can set my aperture to be creative. I can also have control of my shutter speed. So I can have my aperture on the front dial and my, my shutter speed is control on the back dial. And what I can do, it gives me maximum flexibility to amend my aperture for creativity if I need it. For instance, if a big bird lands close to me, I need to very quickly change that to get more depth of field. Um, I won't change my shutter speed, maybe, necessarily, um, but the ISO will adjust as I change my, uh, as I change my aperture. Um, and similarly, um, the shutter speed, for example, um, maybe I'm using a flying bird, I need a thousandth of a second. It then comes and lands on a post, I will then change it down to say a 250th, um, because then the auto ISO function in manual, it will drop the ISO down and I maximise the shot or the lack of grain in my picture. Um, so it does work really well. I find it, it's very useful. So that's manual exposure with auto ISO set. And it does give you a lot of flexibility. It's not quite as quick. And what I would say, because you, you have to think about why you're changing things. And it's, so it's not a sort of um, you know, run, and, run and gun type of uh, mode. And for that, I definitely recommend aperture priority. Um, but as you evolve, and if you are uh, more into wildlife photography, you get more experience and you really understand the impact of your aperture and your shutter speed and you want to change them for those very reasons because you've got a creative idea in mind um, or you realize you can con control um, your noise in your picture by reducing your shutter speed for example then manual with auto iso is a really really cool setting and i say i use that quite a lot um, especially in a venue i know but what i would still say if i'm going somewhere i don't know what to expect go back to aperture priority with your matrix metering have your exposure compensation button ready, but let the camera do the work. And if you suddenly get a special situation, go back and use your compensation dial for that very bright or very dark subject. So look, I really hope that's been helpful. Um, the key thing I would say is, yeah, field craft, definitely learn your field craft, that'll make the biggest difference. Practice like crazy if you can, even if it's in the garden or on the bird table, they're brilliant places to practice. Your dog running around the garden, whatever it may be. Um, but I hope they're helpful. I'd love to hear your comments um, and I'll respond to every comment if I possibly can. And uh, I love making these YouTube videos. I think I enjoy teaching people anyway. And uh, the main thing is just being able to be out here in this fantastic location and uh, although it's about to rain um, but thanks ever so much for watching if you've enjoyed it please subscribe and I say leave some comments or a like um, it really makes me uh, enthusiastic to do some more and enjoy your photography and so for now from me here in this Bluebell Wood um, cheerio and I'll see you again very soon indeed